Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Peter Pomagy, and I'm Chief Executive of uh, the Anna Freud National Centre for Children and Families. This afternoon, we're going to hear about a multi-partner European project, uh, which has collectively developed a mentalization-based curriculum for professionals working in educational settings. What is mentalizing? Mentalizing is understanding action in mental state terms. Why did he shout? Was he angry? Was he frightened? Did he feel ignored? He has his iPods in and he doesn't realize he's shouting. Our minds are opaque. So we have to figure out what's going on in someone else's mind from clues. What's going on around the person? What was it that they are aware of? What is their emotional expression? How does their action fit with their personality? What may we know about their history? The incredible thing is that we are actually really good at this. Understanding of the mental states of both young person and teachers facilitates our understanding of the interactions between them, interpersonal aspects which shape classroom dynamics. Closely linked with experiences of high stress and burnout, the curriculum that we are going to discuss is designed to support professionals to develop how they make sense of their own experiences and also of those who they are engaged with teaching. Such an understanding, we hope, will help them develop professionally and in their professional relational work. Hughes Hutzebel will speak about the importance of the teacher-child relationship in the classroom and how a perspective of mentalizing and epistemic trust, that's just a long word for one's capacity for trust in someone else's knowledge and how readily one transfers knowledge between people in social learning, how mentalizing and epistemic trust can help manage relationships. Tobias Nolte will give an overview of the curriculum and also some of the teaching material developed that is currently being translated into English and will become available for free use. Stefan Gingelmeyer will speak about the structure and some content of a concrete reflective practice with teacher-student relationship. We will combine this with some examples, a toolbox for enhancing mentalization, which is ongoing and growing. So first of all, I'm delighted to introduce our first speaker, Jus Putzabel. Jus Putzabel is PhD in clinical psychology, a full professor at Tilburg University of Social and Behavioral Sciences in the Department of Medical and Clinical Psychology. And Jus works as a therapist as well, and as a researcher at the Wiersprung, a center specialized in the assessment and treatment of so-called personality disorders in the Netherlands. He mainly works with young people with, again, so-called emerging borderline personality disorder, and also their families in a mentalization-based treatment early intervention program, and has strong interest in better understanding pupil-teacher relationships. So, 
Hughes, welcome. Over to you. Thank you, Peter, and uh, thanks for the nice introduction, and also thanks to Tobias for the invitation to participate in this uh, multiplier event that's related to the project we're doing together. Um, I will be sharing my slides first, and um, we'll be talking a bit on um, teachers and therapists and what you and we have in common. and. Uh, so this this will be a bit of a talk about uh, mentalizing and ed educational settings and schools, but it's uh, also a bit of course in Dutch, you could say, because I collected uh, last weeks and months some of uh, the, the the news headlines from uh, Dutch websites as well in Belgium, where I live, as in the Netherlands, where I work. And interestingly enough, the schools and teachers and students were were quite uh, prominent in, in on, on a lot of websites and there was quite a lot uh, to do in the news and but it was a slightly different accent like the focus in the Dutch websites and new news headlines was mainly on the teacher uh, on the students excuse me on the students and and what, what could be seen is that, that the student in the Netherlands is a bit restless and uh, there are lots of conflicts on, on in the classrooms and there are more students uh, displaying behavioral problems and they are they show sort of lack of interest is interest in the class and uh, in general it is false that their mental well-being is a bit under pressure probably as a consequence of the the corona crisis so uh, there is there are some worries about uh, the, the the mental well-being about the behavioral and emotional problems that can be He uh, seemed to have lost uh, Houston. Um, I oh, you're back. Oh, yes, I, I I noticed I was out for a moment. If you feel that you are ready to continue, you and just carry on. Thank you, and and I don't know exactly where I lost you, but um... uh, you you were telling us about uh, the. Uh, concerns uh, about or the uh, concerns about students. Uh, okay, so I'll I'll just continue from there and I'll we'll see. Probably yeah. <laughs> just an introduction, so we'll we'll go on. Um, so so I was just telling that the focus in in uh, the Netherlands was more on the students, while in Belgium the focus is a bit more on the teacher and the teacher who is tired, the teacher uh, who's running away from the school. Uh, in Belgium, one in three teachers who started teaching leaves school after a year, and this is mainly the case in secondary schools. Um, and, and but also in primary schools, about one in four uh, teachers who starts to teach leaves the school after a year. And the reason is a bit that um, as a teacher, it's always end and end. There's always more to do. There are always more assignments uh, that you need to to accomplish. And as a teacher, you need to be a sort of uh, everything. You need to be a psychologist. You need to be a physiotherapist, you need to be a bit of a mom, a bit of a dad, you need to be a coach of the pupils, and you need also to teach them uh, in the end. So, and, and many teachers that were portrayed in the newspaper, they said, well, we're not trained to do all these kind of things. We were trained to be a teacher, but we were not trained to be a psychologist. We were not trained to be um, a physiotherapist and so on. And in addition, the, the attitude of parents is becoming a bit of a problem also. Parents who are critical, parents uh, who are demanding towards teachers. And so teachers have also to manage the, the sort of difficult, difficult kind of contact with, uh, with the parents. And so it comes to no surprise that um, there are many teachers suffering from symptoms of burnouts. This is a bit of graph showing the number of professionals with symptoms of burnout according to the kind of profession they are doing. And at the top, and I don't think this is a ranking you want to be at the top at, are the teachers. About one in five teachers um, suffers from significant symptoms of burnouts. And hey, the, the, the second place, 
there is us, the therapists, or a bit more in general, I think these are the healthcare professionals. About one in six to one in seven therapists suffers from symptoms of burnout. So we, we are number one and two, and this is the first thing we have in common. We are tired. We are suffering from symptoms of burnout, being a teacher and being a therapist. And there is an interesting, this is an interesting finding. I think we could ask ourselves, how come? How come that, that both of us, both of our professions are topping this ranking? And I think one of the reasons, I didn't do research, but one of the potential reasons might be that as a teacher and a therapist, we, we have to deal with human relationships the whole day. We have to deal with emotions, behaviors, relation, contact with uh, other people. Uh, with patients or with pupils or with parents or with colleagues and so on. And, and could it be that the very same thing that uh, makes our job as a, a teacher or a therapist so valuable and uh, makes it so gratifying and satisfying may also be the very same thing that could make it so energy consuming and, and so burdensome from time to time? Because if you, you're able to reach a pupil and if you're able to reach a patient and you can really collaborate and help a kid to grow, this can be very satisfying. But of course, we all know moments in which we we feel frustrated and we're not able to reach the, the, the patient or the pupil and we don't feel as effective as a therapist or a, a, a teacher. And this could be also the moments in which this is a job that asks a lot of energy and burns us a bit out. So it's it's maybe the, 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 the human contact, the human relationship. We need to manage the whole day, uh, which, which could be on the one hand very satisfying, but the other, other hand also um, sometimes very burdensome. And um, this is, uh, I think this project started from the idea that maybe some of the expertise that we have in our therapy room could be transferred uh, to the uh, classroom. And I think one of the basic ideas is that uh, as a therapist, in order to be effective as a therapist, you need to, to be able to deal with a relationship quite well, because a therapist relationship is after all, one of the most important factors determining the effectiveness of therapy. And so relationships are crucial in our job. And maybe some of our knowledge and expertise on relationships can also be transferred to the classroom. This was a bit, I think, the idea we had when we started this project. And um, this, this is a small bridge to the importance of human relationships. They are vital for us. And we all know that if, if people uh, don't have good social relationships with other people, that it affects their life quality and it affects their health. And, and people even live much uh, less long if they don't have uh, good uh, relationships with other people. So loneliness is, 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 is often associated with many severe mental disorders and it shortens the length of your life uh, with 15 years, which is the equivalent of smoking 15 cigarettes every day. So we know relationships matter and, and we know, especially in early childhoods, uh, feeling safe within basic attachment relationships is, is extremely important. The first thousand days are, are very important and not only because you need your parents to have food and all, but also because you need them to feel reassured and to feel comforted. Um, and there is some research showing that uh, children uh, with secure attachment relationships uh, will be less likely to develop a whole range of mental disorders. So safe attachment, feeling safe within a basic relationship with your parents sort of uh, boosts your psychological immunity. It, it helps you. The, 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 the relationship is not extremely strong, but it is a sort of significant, uh, robust relationship that helps you to uh, be more protected against developing mental illness. And in case you would still develop mental illness, uh, if you're having a secure attachment relationship with your parents, it sort of helps in recovering from mental illness. And it doesn't really matter what kind of mental illness, whether it be uh, a conduct disorder, uh, like on the left uh, slide, or a, more a mood disorder. Um, and it doesn't even matter what kind of treatments uh, you, you, will, you will be facing, whether it be psychotherapy or medication. When you have a safe relationship with your parents, it sort of helps in recovery, uh, independent of the kind of diagnosis and independent of the kind of treatments uh, that will uh, try to help you to uh, recover from this mental illness. 
And then children grow up and they become teenagers and uh, their relationships with friends become more important. And there's also quite some re research showing that the quality of relationships uh, that, that teenagers have with their friends also affects their mental well-being in adolescence. It helps them to develop better and it also helps them to deal better with potentially uh, harmful events they have uh, lived through as a child. So uh, good friendship may act as a sort of buffer against the harmful effects of negative childhood experience they have suffered. And then there is the teacher-pupil relationship. And there's also quite some research showing that the quality of the relationship with the teacher has a clear influence on how well uh, kids are involved and motivated in lessons and in school. And this is a, a quite uh, robust effect, a medium effect size, which is quite okay. And it even affects the learning outcomes, although this effect is a bit smaller. It also affects uh, your social functioning as a kid in the classroom, and it reduces behavioral problems. So if as a teacher you're able to sort of develop a safe relationship, it's quite valuable to the, the kids you have in your classroom. And here are some more findings from this kind of research. It shows that negative experiences are relatively more influential than positive experiences. So if you have a sort of conflictual relationship between a teacher and a pupil, this may affect the pupil quite uh, a lot uh, throughout his development at school. And also interestingly, uh, both positive and negative experiences are contagious. So if you do have a, a sort of conflictual relationship in the first year of primary school, it, still can, it, it can still affect you in the last year of primary school. There are still some predictions to be made how you will develop in your last year at, at primary school. This is a negative effect, a sort of negative contagion, but it can also be positive. If you do have a sort of positive relationship with your uh, class teacher, then it will also affect your engagement and also your learning gains in, in other courses uh, with other teachers. So there is a sort of uh, contagion of positive and negative effects uh, that start in this particular teacher-pupil relationship, but it goes beyond this relationship. And so the question then becomes, what is it? A sort of safe, secure, helpful teacher-pupil relationship? Well, it might not be completely the one that I will show you in a minute, but it's it's a beautiful, uh, very brief Oscar winning movie. Um, and if, if you had a bit of an emotional day, this this will be a sort of this will give you the last uh, push uh, because it's quite emotional, this one, but I'll show you.
okay by showing this small movie. I don't want to suggest that, in my opinion, this, this would be a sort of common daily practice in the UK schools, but it's, I think it shows that a mere focus on behavior and controlling behavior might not be the best way uh, to develop the kind of uh, teacher-pupil relationship that uh, leads to the sort of outcomes that I, I, I showed you before. Now, what does constitute a safe teacher-pupil relationship? This is not what I'm saying. This is what comes from the research that I've been showing. It needs to be warm and supportive. It needs to be emotionally close. It doesn't need to be, it, it, it should better be not conflictual. And then it should be sufficiently attuned to a child's individuality. And it needs to sort of convey the message that you, as an individual, you matter. And I just want to uh, give a very small example from my personal experience with our youngest daughter, because some years ago, uh, we moved from a sort of smaller village to a, a bigger city. And uh, so the kids also needed to, to, to change schools. And the two oldest kids, they went to uh, the secondary school, but the youngest one needed to go alone to a new primary school. So I, I went with her the first day of school. And I think both of her of us were a bit uh, in a sort of culture shock um, because we were used to this all white, uh, very small, uh, rural Flemish school. And then suddenly she came in a school that was uh, very diverse eth ethnic ethnically, uh, that was um, a very busy, a sort of urban city school. And I really felt a bit guilty leaving her there behind. Um, but then in the end of the day, she returned home and she was quite happy and she, she had a good day and she liked her teacher and she liked the classroom. And uh, this, this sort of continued uh, the days and weeks after and she sort of very easily seemed to adapt to the new situation. And I think uh, after some weeks, we had a sort of meeting with her teacher and, and we started to understand how came. Um, because the teacher, of course, she, she was sharing her observations on uh, the behavior of our daughter, uh, the kind of things you like to hear as a parent, that she's uh, collaborating well and doing her best at school and et cetera, et cetera. But she also uh, shared her observations on what she thought would be the inner inner experience of our daughter that maybe part of her doing so much her best was also rooted in a sort of insecurity and that uh, maybe she said I still remember the teacher said that maybe one of the the big challenges for our daughter that school year wouldn't be to succeed as she knew quite well how to succeed but to learn to fail and to learn to deal with shortcomings and I think what she demonstrated is a sort of connection with the inner experience of our daughter and she had seen our daughter just behind the external behavior and I think of course she did it with our daughter but probably also with many other kids in in this class and so this this teacher sort of mentalized about our, our daughter and and thereby probably created a sense of safety within this teacher pupil relationship and probably also thereby helped to create a sense of safety within this classroom. So this brings me to the last common ground I want to uh, discuss between teachers and therapists. And as a therapist, we, we have to deal with patients and patients may have over 150 different uh, sorts of diagnosis. And we have about 300, some say 500 evidence based interventions to our disposition. So this feels like a sort of impossible task, how to match all these individual diagnosis pathologies with all these different interventions. It seems as if we are uh, disposed to fall short. Um, and maybe there is a sort of similarity between uh, the impossibility of our task as a therapist and maybe the kind of demands the teacher find in the classroom. Because teachers need to be pedagogically and didactically skilled. They need to be psychotherapists and they need to be psychologists, they need to deal with dyslexia, ADHD, autism, they face divorced families, and they also face the consequences of COVID. So we all maybe feel a bit overwhelmed being a teacher and a therapist by uh, all these demands. And, and still, we share the same robust finding that no matter what a diagnosis or ideal intervention is, what at the end of the day matters most is the kind of relationship we are able to develop. We as a therapist with our patients and you as a teacher with your pupils. And probably uh, like therapists, um, effective teachers also try to connect with their pupils. They try to see them from the inside and help them to open up and to learn from them. And I believe that if this project only helps teachers a little bit to, be, to do this a bit better, 
it could also be a sort of Oscar winning project. Anyway, Peter, I will hand over to you again. Thanks. Thanks very much. Yes, that was, uh, as you said, uh, uh, a rather moving presentation emphasizing the relationship, the importance of the relationship between uh, pupils and uh, uh, teachers. Um, I think we'll uh, move on uh, for the moment. Just I know that you'll come back. I'd like to move on to uh, uh, Tobias uh, Nolte, um, uh, who is um, a medical doctor and is a clinical research associate at University College London and the Anna Freud Center works as an MBT therapist at St. Anne's Hospital London and in private practice as a psychoanalyst. His uh, research uh, spans personality disorders, mentalizing, social learning, and as the other two speakers, he's a project partner in a research and practice network to introduce a uh, mentalization approach to uh, pedagogic fields. Uh, so Tobias, over to you. Thank you, Peter. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you also to the entire um, Anna Freud Center Schools in Mind team for um, hosting us this this evening. I'd like to um, I'd like to follow on from I think uh, your um, really rather interesting um, setting the this stage of what we have done, what we would like to share with you um, today, and as I was preparing I, I wondered how how we could make this uh, the most helpful um, to you because after all you're the ones or a lot of you will be the ones um, with frontline experience you're the ones um, working in pedagogical fields day in to out, day out um, most of you probably as school teachers really and um, in doing so we decided that it probably wouldn't be so helpful to overwhelm or even bombard you with too much um, of scientific findings, too much theory, but perhaps to try something a bit different, perhaps to try to become a bit in this seminar like teachers ourselves, teachers to you in this, in this regard. And I thought it would be helpful, hopefully helpful for you to hear a bit about, almost to hear a bit of a story of what we have done in this three-year project that we would like to to share with you. So just to give you a sense of what I'm going to cover over the next 15 minutes or so, um, I will introduce this mentalization based curriculum um, that we have run a trial version of, if you like. Um, you have a good sense, I think, I certainly do, um, why we may have done it after your um, talk. Um, so I will touch just briefly on the problems or better perhaps on a number of, of all too familiar challenges. I will then talk about what we have done and introduce to you the structure and the content of our course modules, the learning goals, and also some of the materials that we have developed. And I will just touch briefly on the rather important question, of course, has it worked? To what extent or how? Has it worked? And we'll present to you some preliminary um, evaluation findings of our curriculum. And as the last point, um, I'd like, as it were, to prepare you as our audience and us, the speakers, to think a bit later on in the, in the Q&A um, in relation to what next, what could the outlook um, of such a curriculum, perhaps also specifically in the context um, of different countries such as the UK be. So let's go back to this question, why have we done it? Why have we made this, if you like, translational effort, learning from um, a really clinical approach that, that first and foremost was developed to uh, better work with patients, to better work perhaps with patients who were somewhat treatment resistant, but then gradually with time, um, those working within this approach realized that it really touched on as you were saying, a much more basic foundation of the human mind, which is that we're constantly in relationship with others and with ourselves. Um, so it's, it's a translational effort to take something from a clinical realm into work 
within pedagogical fields. And sort of for brevity, I think we were talking about um, teaching pupils in, in a sort of ordinary classroom setting, but we may also encompass um, in that working in special needs education, um, early years um, interventions, for instance, um, social work in the broader sense, This is something, again, taking us back to what you already talked about, that you may feel familiar with. Perhaps particularly so this question, after a number of years in, in the job, do you continue to care and wish that you want to be there for those you teach? But sometimes it just feels impossible. Tobias, I'm really sorry to interrupt. You're not sharing your slides at the moment. You're oh. not sharing your screen. Uh, so, uh, very sorry. Thank you for interrupting, Peter. Yeah. Is that better? It is indeed. It is okay. indeed. So uh, just to go back, this is kind of the structure of the talk. Um, you haven't missed the slide, really. Um, these we thought from experience, but as we were getting together, developing our project over time, were some of the, of the challenges um, that teachers are struggling with, particularly um, the one I drew attention to at the end. Um, and of course, there's a related question uh, that again, you may all be familiar with, do you take stress home, uh, back home from, from school? Maybe one of the key um, difficulties in addition to the day-to-day -day work. Um, and also perhaps a somewhat related but important question, do you wish there was a more consistent approach in thinking about what it's like to be a teacher and thinking about difficulties and how one can address them? Maybe should there, and if so, in what way, be more exchanges um, about what one could do with, with your colleagues so that you don't become or don't continue um, to have a sense of, of being a burden with this on your own? So that, that is sort of where we, where we started. Um, and it might be perhaps rather reassuring to you all to also hear that in addition to, to you, Sutzabad and myself, the majority of our project partners are indeed either teachers themselves or they have uh, long established records at training those who become um, teachers. So they have a very good understanding perhaps of where some of the problems lie and what they look like. So what we have tried to do with this curriculum was to design and implement and also preliminarily so evaluate um, a number of modules, an extended course, if you like, which I will demonstrate and introduce in more detail to you in a moment, for a range of professionals in order to improve mentalizing, in order to improve, let's say, perhaps their understanding of themselves in their day-to-day -day job, but certainly to understand um, or to improve an understanding of those they're dealing with, their, their pupils. And I think it's very important to, to acknowledge um, this particular point. Teaching does, of course, take place in the real world. Um, that means there are a vast amount of, um, there's a vast amount of, of pressures, um, of limitations, of, of structures, of rules that can't be changed, that you can do nothing about. But what is important to us when we designed this curriculum and what we had in mind was that one era where perhaps work can take place is to do with one's internal attitude towards those structures, those pressures, and towards developing a way of how one works within them. And ideally how one does that um, with colleagues and on one, one's own. And of course, working as a teacher is primarily about teaching. That's what your job is. Um, but it's also, as you um, pointed out or illustrated so um, beautifully, it is relational work. In doing so, in teaching, you are in important relationships with your pupils, with colleagues, with parents, with the school as an institution, with a hierarchy within that, but certainly also with yourself.
And without going into detail, I just, I just wanted to maybe refresh this idea to, to some of us. I think Peter very helpfully introduced um, tonight's seminar with a number of questions of how one can understand perhaps how um, a child may, may act, how one can look into what's going on underneath or what's going on behind the internal world of, of such a person. And that's really, in a nutshell, what mentalizing is to do with. Uh, we understand or we define it as, as the capacity to interpret behavior in relation to oneself, but certainly to others, is meaningful because it is motivated by intentional mental states, such as thoughts, feelings, desires, or wishes. And we feel that mentalizing plays a rather fundamental role in understanding these relationships that I've drawn attention to earlier and in enabling social learning through what we call a state of epistemic trust, an openness towards knowledge transfer from a source that can be trusted. And this kind of psychosocial learning, which we think is an integral part to, to teaching or education, is much more likely to take place when we can create moments of interpersonal or inner group curiosity about what's going on in the other when they feel recognized and when they feel understood. That creates, we think, conditions for a person to open up towards someone who may have something meaningful and relevant um, to pass on that perhaps I should then be, be more inclined to, to listen to, to learn from. And if this happens, and I've already, I've already alluded to the fact that very often there are good reasons why this fails or why it can't happen so well, but if it does, then there is a chance for so-called shared intentionality or we moments, which underpin, again, the capacity to learn from someone else. So with all this in mind, the curriculum that we put together, that we designed, had the following goals. To create or perhaps increase an interest in, psychological, in the psychological or internal world of self and others, with its motivations, its feelings, but also in trying to understand how it perhaps can explain some of the associated difficulties, difficult classroom behavior, but also difficulties within myself. If I had a particularly difficult day, can I reflect upon those experiences and become a bit more curious about what, what may have happened, why I may have responded in a particular way. The curriculum also focuses on um, on facilitating collaboration or joint attention, the sort of shared focusing on a particular thing, on how someone is doing, for instance, and thereby to increase social learning. It generally, as you know, is, is aimed at facilitating mentalizing, and particularly so, you could say, trying to regain mentalizing capacity when perhaps it goes out of the window. So one important aspect for that is to recognize stressful situations, how they affect oneself and others, um, and in essence, then how to cope with them. And to achieve all that, we uh, or sort of another aspect of that is that we think um, if one can do that a little bit better, as a lot of, of these things we already do intuitively, but if we can focus on them a little bit more, raise awareness or focus our attention to these processes, then what can result if it goes well is a feeling of increased agency. And we also feel that it was important to equip those who attend our trainings with rather concrete ways of handling particular situations in the various work contexts um, they find themselves working in. So this is our strategic partnership, which is funded by the EU for, for three years. These are the project um, partners spanning three countries. And in the next bit, I would like to, to focus on this on the what we have done um, and tell you just a little bit, give you a bit of a, a, a taste and flavor, if you like, of, um, of what the content um, of the curriculum is like. Um, so we've, we've devised several um, content, if you like, modules um, based on, on three pillars. Um, in module one, we introduce the building blocks of the mentalizing um, concepts, sort of theories and, and concepts um, in module two, um, we focus on recognizing what ineffective mentalizing looks like and how interpersonal stress um, 
can really set something in motion that can even lead to the um, complete breakdown um, of mentalizing. But it's quite important to understand what that looks like. And then as a lot of um, teaching takes place in group settings, we thought it was very important to also think about um, with those doing the, the curriculum, what type of mentalizing um, interventions we can devise that enhance um, such a sort of curiosity or group atmosphere um, so that mentalizing can also take place or, or, or filter through in, in group um, settings like a classroom, for instance. Um, in module four, we focus on what we call the pedagogical stance and devise an initial set of, of interventions um, that facilitate that um, in a nutshell or in, in sort of slightly um, less convoluted um, terminology. This is to do with um, the way, the attitude that we take towards ourselves and those we're, we're teaching, the curiosity to understand um, what's going on in ourselves and, and in others. The second pillar is something completely different. Um, so modules five and, and six, um, they um, focus very much on, on practical skills, if you like, um, what we call quote unquote uh, interventions. So ways of interacting in a particular situation, um, but also a toolbox with really quite um, sort of practice focused um, aspects of how one can apply um, you know, tasks, exercises, um, in day-to-day -day situations. And um, module six, part of this, the second pillar, that's really something that we've come to value and our participants a lot, which is, um, and um, Stefan Gingelmeier will, will um, expand on this. This is the reflective practice with case material where participants are invited to bring in usually rather difficult experiences from their own um, practice. And we thought it's important to develop a safe space um, for those experiences to be thought about. And the third pillar is more to do with um, giving the curriculum, but also those who are attending, um, a sense for the evidence base, sort of following on from your Stutzbaut's presentations. What are, the, what are the problems? What does the science um, tell us about that? And how can we make sure that what we're, that what we're teaching, what we're passing on, also is embedded um, in sort of uh, scientific rigor. Um, and very importantly for this, for this last pillar is also that as our day-to-day -day work doesn't just occur in a kind of island, but in an institution, if we're thinking of a school, we thought it's very critical also to have some of our teaching focus on reflecting organizational or institutional um, aspects. This is just one um, example of um, what a module looks like. So for instance, in module two, we're, we're concerned with um, under which relational conditions um, do we tend to learn better and how can those be created? We're also dealing with what does social learning, when does social learning become impossible? Um, and also what the different facets of mentalizing are. What does it look like uh, in its day-to-day -day occurrence? And what happens, as I said already, when main mentalizing does indeed break down? And the practical aspects of module two, for instance, are to do with uh, diagnost diagnostics. How does one recognize when I myself or someone else no longer mentalizes? What types of non-mentalizing um, can we differentiate? So very importantly, the way we then set about or went about the, the training was that we had, um, and then I'm coming to the end with, with my part, we had um, a five-day in-person, so rather in-depth um, opening. Um, so we met for five days. Before um, this took place, participants did a lot of um, online self-study, mainly to do with um, starting to um, familiarize themselves with the concepts and the um, um, the theories. Um, and then we had in three regional centers 
for a duration of 12 weeks, small group um, reflective practice. As, and we'll hear a bit more about that in a moment. And we had a final, again, in-person concluding um, part. So overall, um, we spent eight days with those who did this curriculum, but there was sort of extra work that, that happened beforehand. We've produced a number um, of teaching films. We've also produced um, teaching um, slides and the toolbox, which we will make um, available to you. Um, and the very last slide um, upon which I will end is that we also did a preliminary pilot, if you like, investigation as to did this curriculum work um, or not, or in what way, because we, of course, wanted to understand that a bit better. Um, it's a relatively small sample. Um, the design was such that we compared those who did the entire curriculum against those who only did the self-study block, the, the, the sort of on their own learning. Um, and I'm going to finish on just um, an overview of what these instruments that we use in order to assess how things work, what they look like. We devised the film um, that as part of this evaluation, we administered a number of um, questionnaires, but very interestingly also, and this is something we hadn't intended to do, we learned from our participants. So we had luckily, I would say, uh, on the last evening, the idea that instead of just presenting them with how we thought they should um, evaluate the curriculum, we asked them to present their own ideas. So we co-constructed um, an evaluation with them, which was in the end much more meaningful. And has it worked really? Well, this is a complicated figure. All I want to see show here with the, with these um, red uh, lipstick circles is that in a number of domains that we were interested in, for, for instance, our participants' curiosity towards the mentalizing approach, or the way they they felt um, emotionally, or indeed the way they did mentalize, we saw for this rather small uh, initial um, evaluation, small to medium size. Um, effect sizes in the way that we had um, anticipated. So people's mentalizing did increase. They felt a bit more interested in what it's like to think about this work relationally. And this was rather promising um, to us. And that's perhaps where I want to leave you um, for now. And um, would like to hand back over to you, Peter, and to um, Stefan. Thanks so much, uh, Tobias. You had a, a pretty gargantuan task there to present uh, what is uh, quite a uh, complicated uh, uh, study and a complicated intervention. Um, so well done, uh, getting so much of it across. Our final speaker is uh, Stefan uh, Giegelmeier, and who is a professor and doctor and is a special needs education teacher a professor of psychology and diagnostics in special education needs, is uh, also uh, happens to be a group psychoanalyst um, and uh, uh, is one of the spokespersons for MENTED, uh, which is um, a, a EU and Germany funded network in uh, mentalization based pedagogy. So, uh, if I could ask you, Stefan, to round off uh, these three presentations, please. Thank you, Peter. Thanks a lot for introducing. And thank you to the schools in mind team and to the whole audience for attending. That's really nice. And I hope I will finish this in a good way of I will share my screen. <clears throat> So the thing that is um, just you know, <laughs> so the thing is um, to, to end this present presentation is to go more in details for the application of um, the whole curriculum that we developed. And Tobias Nolte already told us something about it. But first, let me have you um, share two really principal ideas of this whole curriculum, uh, because the, they are really simple, but they are so important that we always 
keep on to repeat them. The first thing is a quote from Alan, and Alan says, mentalizing produces mentalizing, and conversely, non-mentalizing is produced by non-mentalizing. And the point is that there is, of course, as you all know, a specific developmental windows for the de development of mentalization, but this is kind of a mantra from Ellen, and is this mean, means it is valid for all ages. This means it really makes sense to mentalize and to keep and feel mentalized. And this is true for psychotherapy and education as well. And the other thing is that we really assume that every beneficial pedagogical intervention presupposes mentalizing in a pedagogical professionals and institution in all of the fields. So we are really keen on schools, we are keen on social work as well, and we are keen on early childhood education. And this sentence that every beneficial pedagogical intervention is a mentalizing one is especially true for two kind of kid, children and youth for the really young ones talking about oh to three years old and the really psychosocial burden one that we're talking about. And this is really a group that we know from a psychiatric um, uh, point of view and an educational one. So what I want to show you right now is how we have the more soft, the more dynamic parts in the in the in this curriculum. So I tell you a little bit about the mentalizing reflective practice, as Tobias Nolte already said. I show you the structure and I show you, I read out for you a concrete case example, one of from one of the attendees. I show you some everyday activities, so-called intervention that promote mentalizing um, stance and mentalizing interactions and dynamics. I show you some of the playful exercises and development of a toolbox for that we use for everyday work. And I, as I think this is always the most important thing, uh, how we introduce a mentalizing group process and how we tried at least to invent a we mode. Um, Sorry. So this is uh, the first uh, um, idea of um, how the reflective practice, which I did with teacher students mainly, um, was structured, how this mentalizing case supervision was structured. And uh, the first thing was that the participants, it were 12 at the first time, prepared everyone a case presentation. Um, this had an... Sorry, Peter. Uh, I'm sorry, Dave, your slides aren't moving forward. I don't know oh. if they're supposed to be moving forward. Uh, yeah, they should, yeah. Are they right now? Maybe. No, uh, I think they're sharing the wrong screen, uh, is my guess. Uh, That's strange. Share... But, but, but did they move in the beginning? No, they just the first came on. Uh, uh, can you can you see the slide with the okay. with the chair? Yeah. It, no, no. Are they it's moving? Not, it, they're moving now. Yeah, they're moving. Good. But the one I can see is application transfer and mentalizing process. All right. Yeah, but, but that's the headline of every slide. <laughs> but fine. I, I give it a try. Just, just tell me if, if they are not moving. So I was saying. Um, um, there was a descriptive and an interpretative part, and then there was an opening question in the beginning of every um, um, meeting, which held for 90 months. Uh, 90 minutes. Um, the question was, how do you arrive today? Um, then the presenter um, of this uh, meeting read out uh, her own or his own vignette, but only the descript descriptive part. And then we had some clarification questions. We had um, an exploration and discussion of content, and we were discussing how mentalizing and non-mentalizing it was, but the presenter, he, uh, he or she was supposed only to listen and then the presenter read out her or his um, uh, interpret interpret interpretative part and then afterward the group and the presenter developed a mentalizing understanding of this vignette 
together one could say in a we mode and then there was the question what actions and really interventions could result from this group discussion and uh, the close uh, closing question always was what of the content do we leave here with the group and what do you take away and the one thing is this doesn't sound really new or really special but it really helped um to to get um to think about problems with uh, what uh, that these teacher students had while they are working with mainly in special education really severe uh, disturbed um, um, children with really um, serious problems um, emotional and social ways so i hope um, that it now moves on the slides and i'd like to read out a short uh, kind of an uh, of this of of an vignette um that Alisa Flattig, one of the teacher students produced. And um, it's called, I Don't Make Deals. And it's the story of Miroslav. And Miroslav is banned from recess on Monday because he left the school ground without permission on Friday. During the cl clarification discussion of a conflict that happened during one of the breaks on Friday, Miroslav was not very cooperative. Rather, he disrupted the conversation, whereupon he was sent back to his class by the teacher. However, he never arrived there. When he was called to the residential group about 40 minutes after the end of class, he had not shown up there either. Miroslav's class teacher comes to school later on Monday morning, the first hours until the break, the co-teacher and I are in the classroom. At the beginning of the break on Monday, Miroslav is given the option of helping to clean up in the kitchen or of sitting in the classroom. He chooses to sit in the classroom while the co-teacher and I clean up the kitchen with, it, with two other students. When I go to check on Miroslav a few minutes later, he's no longer sitting in the classroom. I find him alone at the football table. He's now not allowed to stay there or to play as long as he's banned from recess. So I ask him to go back to classroom. When he doesn't respond, I grab the ball and I explain that he's not allowed to play table football while he's banned from recess. I slowly turn away, hoping that this time he will come into classroom with me. Miroslav then takes another ball out of the pocket of his sweater and continues playing. I turn back to him and I ask him once again to proceed to the classroom. He ignores me. Meanwhile, he mumbles to himself that none of these interests him and says to me, yeah, so what do you, do you guys want to do anyway? What are you going to do? I don't want to threaten him. I confer briefly with the coach and explain to her what has happened so far. She encourages me to try again to resolve the situation on my own. So I go back, always in, having in mind that this is a teacher student. So I go back to the table football and sit across from Miroslav. I look at him and ask him, if he knows why he's banned from recess today. In his response, he relates the break ban directly to the conflict at recess on Friday. I explained to him that the break ban has nothing to do with the conflict to begin with, but rather with the fact that he simply left unannounced and without permission when it came to talking about this conflict. I tell him that's not possible that we are worried. He replies like that we were worried, like you don't, you like you didn't do that before. I tell him, tell him again that I can't let him play table football. He replies again, what are you going to do? I offer him a deal because I hope to get through, through him that, we, uh, that way. I say to him, I'll play football against you. And if I score the first goal, we'll go to classroom. He Im immediately gets on board with me, with my suggestion and replies, okay. And if I score the first goal, then I get to go uh, out for recess. I reply that that uh, I can't, and I shouldn't make the deal like that. So he suggests, if I score the first goal, then I get to stay here playing football. I agree and we play for a few minutes. When I score the first goal, so the teacher student scores the first goal, I ask him to go into classroom with me. He ignores me, requ my request and continues to play for himself. I say, hey, we had a deal. He doesn't respond. I keep trying. We made this deal together and, and now it's gone my way. Um, so come on, Miroslav responds, I don't make deals. I say to you, you made a deal with me, he replies. Um, I don't make deals with anyone. And then I say, 
that he should have said that before. And that yes, I, I'd ask him if we were making a deal. He ignores me slowly, the other students come out of recess. I teach class after a break, break so I decide to go into classroom and get ready. With the other students coming in, I have less of a chance to have a serious conversation with Miroslav anyway. So um, as we're running a little short of time, I just um, want to read out this and you can keep this in mind and perhaps you can we can have a little discussion on this, why this is a really, in, in, in my um, sense of view, a really good um, uh, idea, how, what mentalizing, uh, how is it important, uh, especially for training teachers, but also for, for, for teachers already uh, teaching um, uh, with, uh, with kids um, anyway. So let's um, go on as we had, this was one part, the, the, the really um, reflective praxis. We ha also have everyday activities as we were um, in, a, in, a, in a gorge with uh, 50 persons. And as it's written here, for some, it was more like a leisure walk and for others, it was a physical and psychological exhaustion. And what we really tried to do was to, to, to talk, to get into, to talk to about this in a group, in group wise, you can really imagine 50 people, there were questions, why didn't we uh, make, made it to stay together? Why were some walking so, quickly, why were others walking so slowly? And they all had um, the perception in the beginning to really um, have a, a, a look um, what is on a, in a mentalizing way going on. And um, then have we really had a chance to discuss this big social event of, um, of being in a gorge with really 50 uh, different persons. We also had this kind of playful exercises, um, which were for which led to a, a development of a toolbox. And just to have, let you see one of these really simple but effective um, uh, games or uh, plays was uh, that we had a little group of, let's say, 20 persons. They all had their eyes shut and they had um, they had, had to uh, count to 20, but with eyes shut and it was not allowed that two people uh, would talk at the same time. So this really means um, to get an understanding how collaboration works and how important, for example, seeing in other, each other and having this kind of uh, perhaps of ostensive cues or any cues uh, that one could see. And then you can, you know, um, tell another one by, by uh, seeing and, and having a little eye um, contact that he or she would now count. But this doesn't work if you don't see um, the other persons of the group. We had a lot of these kind of cooperation uh, games where it's always better to uh, to, co um, to, to communicate, but communication is, of course, in this kind of games, always difficult. And um, this is what, is what we did and what you will find uh, soon on our uh, homepage, uh, the, the whole the toolbox and mentalization in practice. And then what I already said is this uh, kind of mentalizing group process, uh, or one could say uh, that we try to invent a remote. All the actions that you heard from one to three are attempted to be digested uh, mentalizingly in an open but guided group process, uh, of course, with fixed times, it was not opened at all, but it was 90 minutes every day uh, in a chair circle setting. This is the basis and development of a Wii mode, and it needs uh, and produces um, mentalization. That's uh, the main reason. And uh, um, just to uh, have you uh, get an idea what a Wii mode means, and perhaps Peter can talk on this a little later. It's a special set of mental uh, processes reserved for shared cognition, uh, or we can call it also a re relational mentalization. One can say if you want to co cooperate, you need to have um, kind of a we mode that, that one that people can think together um, on a, a special task. So um, this is um, my, my, I had this uh, quote from, from Ellen in the beginning, which said that, that uh, um, mentalizing produces mentalizing and conversely, non-mentalizing produces non-mentalizing. This is what we really tried to create in such a remote um, that, that we had by digesting, for example, this uh, walk uh, or torture, uh, one could say, in the gorge um, um, would make then uh, um, or would develop into a, a mentalizing stands for all of the particip participants 
obviously the ones who were exhausted, really exhausted, they really had uh, uh, difficulties uh, that they could uh, feel the sense, the mentalizing sense of this um, uh, walk in, or hike, hike in the gorge. And the others who, who made it easily, they also had problems to think about how difficult this could be. So this uh, was the everyday lesson. And this is really important to have it in such a group uh, discussion uh, to, uh, to create a remote. So uh, what I can say is that um, you, you are really invited to visit our language. It will be in English uh, really soon. So uh, if the ones of you who are able to speak German, you can already read it and the other ones can see it, let's say in a month, really deeply invited. And um, just uh, to be uh, some to share that we are really pr proud that uh, we have a new grant from Movetia. So we will bring mentalization based education now to Switzerland as well. And perhaps one day we will also what we'd like to uh, bring it even more to the UK. Thank you very much, Stefan. And perhaps you could stop sharing. That's great. Um, and perhaps the other speakers could come back and come online. Uh, there is a, a, a very simple uh, message in one way that you have told us about, which is you can create a relatively brief program of work where you draw attention to the human capacity to mentalize. And when you deliver that program to teachers in imaginative and uh, uh, perhaps uh, quite uh, uh, interesting and, and, and uh, uh, engaging ways like going uh, uh, through a gorge um, uh, and feeling exhausted as I would. Um, but in, 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 uh, in these contexts, that actually uh, helps you in the difficult positions that you find yourself when a, a child doesn't want to make any or you know, makes a deal, but then goes back on a deal. Um, uh, but uh, uh, it's um, uh, very, the simple message is that the work of a teacher can be more rewarding, more effective, uh, and uh, uh, perhaps uh, also in, in, a, in a way um, uh, more um, uh, survivable, if I may say that, uh, uh, easy to survive. Um, if uh, we see beyond uh, the physical reality and look at the psychological reality uh, that a, a young person is experiencing and, and see the world from their point of view. Okay, I've got some questions for you, um, which uh, have come through in, in the meantime. And uh, uh, I don't know, we'll see how who addresses which one, but we've got a few minutes for them. So um, uh, a first very general question um, uh, is, um, uh, is there any consideration given to how teachers' attach, own attachment experiences may have influenced their mentalizing abilities? I, I, I think you, use this is maybe one of you, yours. Uh, I'm, no. I think I, I wanted to pass it to Tobias or Stefan. I think they, you were more closely involved in in, in the course and. Uh, the design of the course, uh, so maybe you can tell something in what way personality features were taken into account when when delivering the course or yeah it's an it's a really interesting question again there's there's a sort of precedent if you like if we but we don't want to overemphasize this either with this parallel to the um the clinical realm psychotherapists and how their attachment experiences if they get assessed um, impact on their training and their effectiveness as, as therapists. We, we weren't particularly interested perhaps uh, in, in assessing that. What we, what we perhaps have to say is that um, we wanted, because this was an initial um, run of this curriculum, we, we perhaps wanted to engage those who felt some inclination towards the topic an interest in it. So uh, we're dealing with, in other words, a self-selected sample. It wasn't that these people um, had to attend the curriculum, but they opted um, to do so. 
it's a bit of a longer answer to we don't really know. Uh, but we certainly had a group of people who I strongly felt were particularly interested in this approach and really wanted to, to hear more. Okay, yes, maybe you'd want to answer the next question. Um, um, how can someone, be that a therapist or be that a teacher, recover from burnout? I would like to pass all questions. I think no. I think it's it's it's, it's a, uh, of course a very relevant question for many teachers and probably also for many therapists, as you've seen the numbers. And and I think it's always a bit. Um, I mean, the, 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 it, it's it's not that there is one simple solution. I think to burnout, probably burnout has in an individual case also many causes, etc. So I think like mentalizing will not be the sort of miracle solution, but it's it may be helpful. So I, it may be just one piece of the solution, I think. Uh, so what, what we offer in this course, I think how it could help is that teachers and therapists become more aware of their own emotional experience. And I think in my clinical experience, many people with burnout are often sort of running over their emotional experience and just trying to meet expectations they think others have of them. So they sort of, always uh, focusing on the other and, and, and social expectations and so on. So I think mentalizing could be helpful just to, to relate a bit more to, to, to your own emotional experience and how uh, tired you may be are or what, what your uh, capacity to still tolerate is, is. So this could be one way I think in which it would be helpful. I think also when we talk to teachers also in, 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 in the sort of also in this project, another project is that um, many teachers also um, experience a sort of uh, difficulty to really uh, address, uh, for example, differences of differences in opinion with parents easily. So I think they are also often burdened by how to deal with, for example, contacts with parents, but also contacts with colleagues with whom they have a difference in opinion. So I think maybe this course could also help a little bit to have somewhat more skills to address differences in opinion, differences in perspective to, to manage this kind of difficult conversation a bit better, which might also be helpful to experience a bit less burden uh, from this part of your work. But it will only be, I think, a very small part of, 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 of the whole solution. And one thing just to, to, uh, to say something um, to yours is uh, that the, the aim of um, um, having having this uh, is a median distance um, to your job. It's not uh, one of the problems teachers and other uh, professionals in educational jobs have is that they're either too, too close or too far away from their job. So um, after kind of a therapy, um, uh, burnout therapy, it would be really good if, if persons would have an idea. This is um, a stance of not being too close, but not being too far away from my job. So, and this really needs mentalizing that I can understand what does it mean to go, to go close, but then to go back again, that I have kind of a, um, a, a really healthful way of dealing with this really interactive kind of job, highly interactive kind of job. This is really a difference i think to psychotherapy that you, you that you have um uh, in class for example also in kindergarten or in social work you have to deal with uh, with groups with groups of kids and um this is really highly interactive just whilst um uh, we are talking uh stefan are you um uh, thinking about any further trainings um is this the beginning of something or uh, so what's the program? Yeah, Peter, this is the beginning um, of, a, of, a, of a curriculum that we really want to, to start off. The one thing that Toby already said is um, the curriculum is so far ready, but it will be, uh, it, it's, it's changeable and it's, of course uh, we can even make it better uh, than this. But the one thing that we really want to do is a, um, is a big investigation um, on, on a huge number of people and really uh, try to find out if it works in a big number of people uh, but uh, we're really kind of proud that we have this uh, that we have this curriculum um, and yeah this is uh, how, uh, how we where we are at the moment mm -hmm. uh, I mean linked to that one person wants to know if there 
uh, are ways that they could use the curriculum because um, they're interested in incorporating aspects of this in a two-year program uh, that uh, they run on attachment and developmental trauma um, uh, for senior leaders in local authority. Um, so could they take aspects of your program and incorporate it in theirs? If they speak German, or wait until the English comes out? The English is about to come. Uh, Toby, uh, Toby, did you want to ask, uh, to, to answer? Yeah, the, so we're in, in the final stages of preparing the, the teaching materials um, in English. So they're, they're, they're almost um, ready to be used off the shelf, um, not for much longer. But I can imagine, again, as, as, we've, as we've all thought and felt um, this evening, um, what, what the question implies is, again, another setting where relational work is at, at the core. So I'm, I'm pretty sure that a number of the um, conceptual and, and theoretical aspects um, that we've devised would fit really neatly um, with that to facilitate that. Mm -hmm. Wait, one question, I don't know who uh, this would be addressed to, um, but one very basic question here is, Shouldn't a teacher be a teacher in the first place and not a psychologist or a therapist? Um, aren't we uh, uh, mixing things up uh, in, in a not necessarily terribly helpful way? Bit challenging, I guess. I'm not sure whether I have the answer, but I, I would agree that a teacher needs to be a teacher in the first place. But a teacher also has to deal with issues in the classroom, whether he or she wants it or not. And I think you cannot not deal with issues like behavioral problems or emotional problems or uh, relational issues, etc. So I, I don't think that that basic message, at least in my opinion, from this uh, project is that uh, shouldn't be that teachers should be sort of uh, half psychotherapists, but the teachers may I don't benefit from some of the expertise that, that comes indeed from clinical practice, but that may be helpful also to deal a bit more comfortable with, with issues they have to deal with anyway. They have no choice uh, as to deal with these kind of issues in their classroom. Um, but, but please let the teacher be the teacher, yes. Uh, but so how was the course received in German schools? Is there, what did you encounter any resistance? To implementing the curriculum. Stefan? So far, we haven't, um, uh, we, we, we are, we're right now um, uh, training teacher students at the moment because we had two from the program. So we're, we're um, starting in next year in February and uh, in autumn uh, to start with schools, but, but they are free to, to, to book us uh, as a, as a, as a uh, course, as a seminar. So um, we haven't had any uh, experience with, with the resistance of the um, educational system so far. Um, of course, um, um, dealing with persons in a reflective practice, resistance was always a, a big topic as it is. What, what perhaps this touches on, if I can just follow up, is, is of course the opportunity that if one implements such an approach in addition to day-to-day to -day practice at an institutional level, is that you have much more, ideally, you have much more cross-fertilization. You're not just sending an individual trying to, to implement something on their own. But uh, if it goes well, you'd have the, the chance perhaps to create um, a kind of institutional culture that's perhaps gradually and with time more informed by mentalization-based um, approach. Mm -hmm. uh, how can, would this work if you have um, children in the class who have really quite serious mental health issues? Or is this an approach that works better um, with those who uh, uh, are like Hasse, who's uh, really a, a nice kid, but it just really helps if uh, the teacher has a good understanding of the, 
uh, Karen needs and uh, maybe at the moment, at, at any one moment, they need to learn to fail. Uh, just quite a sophisticated understanding of a child. So will it work with uh, uh, severe mental health problems? I think the first answer is that um, a teacher normally does mentalize. So this is this is really, uh, I think, a, a really important answer, and it no normally works if he's interested uh, on relation with his or her pupils. So, and I think this uh, kind of curriculum also emphasis uh, kind of difficult uh, children, children at risk, for example, children who are burdened from mental health, issue, health issues. So we really hope that in health services, we can have, um, um, we can develop an idea how to deal better in the cooperation between schools and a mental health service. This is an issue that really is in Germany and as, um, as I know from yours and from Toby as well, kind of difficult, um, uh, the, the cooperation between the, the health and the educational branch. Well, I, I want to Add that I think we, we, we need to improve much here because I think uh, that there is always a sort of tendency to have it's either school or treatment or something, at least in the Netherlands, there's a sort of uh, either you're able to go to school or you're too mentally impaired and you need to go in treatment, then treatment needs to have the first uh, place in your life, etc. Well, I think probably the best treatment is, is being still able to remain in a healthy environment as school often is and, and maybe we need to, to, to look for ways to support the school and the teacher and the pupil uh, to be able to, to remain at school, because I think this, this still guarantees the best in healthy environment, often for most uh, pupils. So, And I think, of course, then it, it might sometimes be helpful to engage the, the, the teacher within treatment in some way, or at least to help the teacher, for example, um, uh, detect so certain losses in mentalizing uh, in, in, in relation to this kid, for example, and, and support a bit more uh to 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 restore mentalizing in 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 a sort of difficult relationship uh, but there's still i think at least in the netherlands um a lot of uh, a lot to win still to implement this a bit more systematically and this is also an issue of um of inclusion isn't it uh, so we are everybody is talking about inclusion i think this is one of the main topics of inclusion how kids also with severe mental health problems can stay in an educational in the normal educational system i think uh, we won't have uh, time for uh, the rest of the questions uh, unfortunately uh, i know that you guys have to go I want to uh, thank you very much, Tobias, Stefan, who's very interesting, very thought provoking, um, and interesting that uh, you were able to introduce it into a teacher training program uh, um, in uh, Germany. It's uh, not necessarily as easily implemented in this country, but uh, I really appreciate um, you coming, but also really appreciate. Uh, those uh, of you could attend the seminar and uh, I hope that you found aspects of it useful. Our colleagues uh, in a different part of uh, uh, the world, Europe uh, work. Uh, we are at the moment planning uh, seminars for the next academic year. And if you would like to be sent information about the upcoming seminars, just do sign up to our Schools in Mind network uh, to hear about it first. Um, uh, the end of the seminar will be uh, followed by a, a little redirection to a feedback form and uh, of course if you could take a few minutes to uh, uh, fill that in, uh, that would be uh, uh, really wonderful. But uh, for the moment, uh, time uh, is uh, running on, so what I would just like to say once more, use Tobias, Stefan, thank you very much for your presentation and thank you very much everyone for coming. Have a nice rest of the day. <laughs>